um, I was uh, in Fleming House here in Alice Smith. So I was actually in Java Bellamy. So that was my campus. Uh, yeah. oh, I was here in the mid. Uh, I was here in the mid 80s and I'm just really glad to be sitting on stage and not wearing that gingham dress because it was such a, such a top one. Um, yeah, so it's great to be back. I'm still a parent, so I'm always here. Um, so, what did you pursue after Alice Smith and um, what were your career choices that finally led to your position now? Um, yeah, so I left um, Alice Smith, in fact, I left Malaysia when I was 10 years old. I went to UK boarding school. so. From there I went on to university in the UK and in France, I was uh, also doing my master's degree in France, in Paris, and also spent a couple of years studying in Barcelona, in, in Spain. So uh, my career choices have been really varied, varied from journalism, advertising, corporate comms, um, I was in L'Oreal headquarters in Paris for five years. And uh, that's where I met, uh, well not in Paris is where I met my husband and uh, then we decided to come back to Malaysia. So that's been about 10 years now. So. Now I'm doing a lot of charity causes, I'm also a corporate board director in a public listed company and uh, so my charity, my causes include Make-A-Wish Malaysia, I'm the world patron for Make-A-Wish. <laughs> <laughs> Including uh, Say No to Plastic and Zero Food Wastage to the campaigns that I um, kick-started in 2016 really long history so there's no point going through it all but um, the reason I've got Free Tree Society actually has an Alice Smith connection and it was as a parent sitting outside the reception classrooms that I was talking to a fellow mom Bettina Khan and I was telling her about my idea to, to grow trees and give them away to green urban scapes and it just so happened that I was talking to the right person the community at Alice Smith was always so fantastic and uh, Long story short, within four months it had gone from an A4 sheet of paper idea to a registered NGO and we've just gone from strength to strength. Um, and being able to be green at this point in the climate crisis and, and leading knowledge is, is really fantastic. So being able to keep in touch with Alice Smith and guide them and share knowledge with them and their journey to be green is also um, really great. So what were the... Over to you guys, Dave, Rushman, and Najwa. Uh, what was your background during your study in the career path? So, hi. Um, well, I left uh, school after A-levels, joined the police, actually, for seven years. Then I moved over to the diplomatic service. I've now been with the Foreign Office for over 20 years. I've uh, served in Lagos, Pretoria, Washington, Madrid, and now Kuala Lumpur. Uh, I guess I didn't really know much about the environment or probably even think much about it while I was in the police or you know, school. But once you start looking at the British government, uh, that changed pretty quickly. Uh, the UK prides itself on being a global leader on the environment, whether that's climate change, uh, tackling illegal wildlife, uh, plastic waste. And so as a diplomat serving overseas, you have got to be a quick study. You've got to work with other countries, whether that's negotiating projects or trying to influence them to take more action. And so, yeah, this is you know sort of 24-7 is stuff that's in your interest. And as I did some of that, I really enjoyed it. I really you know, started to feel and care about it. Uh, I started to look for jobs that had an environment angle. And I guess the highlight of that for me was probably going to Washington, where I was the climate change and energy lead for four years. That was sort of late Bush, early Obama. Uh, it was quite a tough gig, uh, probably not as hard as it was Trump uh, at the moment in the US, I imagine. Uh, but there's a lot of great stuff going on in the US. I think it doesn't get you know, spoken about much. And now I'm here as the deputy commissioner. I guess I have some influence on what our post um, focuses on. So we decided to make climate change, in particular as well as plastics, uh, a big priority for us. And I'm working very closely with Mestec. We've got a lot of projects underway which I might say something a bit more about later. But of course the UK is hosting the next big climate change conference in Glasgow, COP26 in 2020. Uh, and that's a massive moment for the world and it's going to be big for the UK as we kind of take the chair of it. Hi, good morning everybody, and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Rashwin, and so in school, I, I went to a public school in KL, um, Victoria Institution, down the road, near Bellamy actually. <clears throat> and in school, I was quite playful. Um, definitely not as inspiring as Loretta or Dvich. Um, <laughs> quite silly for sure. Um, then I went on to do my studies. I did accounting and finance, which people find quite random or quite interesting. Um, you know, not really an engineering background or a science background. Then I worked in corporate, so I was in PwC for 
four years, which is quite different from what we're doing now. But it was then when I really had a moment, and I'll be honest, right? So I wasn't very, I mean, I was conscious, but I wasn't like leading any any small movement. I wasn't very active. I was just, you know, being a very average um, public person. But then it was then when I had this really good realization. So I was working with big corporates and looking at a lot of big financial institutions and frameworks. And one thing really hit me was that at that point I realized that we've got all the bloody money in the world, all the technology in the world, and all the talent in the world, and to solve every problem that we have. And it was then that it hit me that if I'm not doing something about it, then technically I'm part of the problem and not part of the solution. That's when I decided to quit my job, and with a few other co-founders, we started with GPG. here and then um, but my mother taught me to be quite green at a young age so I think she was like the OG of cyclist in our family I mean I always reused everything and I never threw anything away so I always had always been green I think when I um, finished school um, I have just went to public school um, I would like kute sampa kute sampa means um, I would actually like find litter on the side of the road and I would actually pick them up and then my friends would like tell me off because they're like Hunch, what are you doing um, so I, I've always known I was quite a greenie from a young age, and then when we moved to Australia, we all migrated in 1999. Um, I found a course called Environmental Engineering, so I've been doing that. Because I thought environment, and then I'm a practical person, so I feel like if I want to change the world, I want to make it like practical. So I thought, okay, engineer, that's great. What a good course, and I love the course. I would highly recommend it. Who wants to be an engineer in this room? Talk to me later. <laughs> but I've been doing that. Um, I've been doing that for like the last 15, 16 years of my life. So, um, and then I've come back here recently because I want to spend a bit more time with my grandma, full circle, uh, and doing on my own thing with my own sustainability consultancy. Thanks for having me. Thanks. It's true. I mean, I think in Malaysia, the awareness is there. Um, you know, we have this haze. It's been ongoing for decades. It's not just this year. But every year, it seems to be getting a lot worse. And, um, you know, a lot of people tend to sort of point fingers and start blaming. But we've got to look at ourselves. And I always say, we are ultimately responsible. It's how we consume. It's how we lead our daily lives and our habits. Um, you know, if we take public transport and we walk more, then at least we are doing something in reducing our carbon emissions. Um, if we're reducing the aerosols, I mean, there's lots of things we can look at. I'm also a diver, so I do dive to see what's going on underwater. I've done a lot of underwater dive cleanups, as well as beach cleanups. I organize a lot of that as well. And every time that I've gone diving in some of my, our most amazing places, like uh, on the east coast, in Trunganu, in Redang, or Printian, but I see this coral bleaching. Coral bleaching is not just from the fact that we have the waters getting warmer due to climate change, but also the fact that there's a lot of plastic in uh, on the seabeds. And the half of the time I have no idea whether it's plastic or it's coral, so I'm very scared of like picking it up. So the, normally the marine biologist is like, yeah, that, that, that's, yeah, that's plastic. And we picked up just one uh, dive underwater cleanup, we picked up about uh, 
let's say, 4,500 water bottles, plastic water bottles. That's just in one day. And we had, we, we, it was about, I think, about four, five, four, 455 kg of plastic trash from just that. So, I mean, climate change, yes, we're talking about the air, we're talking about deforestation, we're talking about burning, we're talking about, the, you know, the, there's lots more flooding. A lot of times people talk about flooding and climate change, and I'm like, well, you've got to look to yourself, because if I look at the drains, and I take a lot of pictures of drains, I know people think I'm crazy, why am I taking pictures of drains? And I'm like, if you look inside a drain anywhere in Climb Valley, you'll see there's a whole bunch of plastic trash. You see flip-flops, you'll see, you know, plastic water cups, straws, bottles, and you're like, what? You can't take out the drain because the drain is it's stuck. And there is, a, just in KLCC area, water is coming out of the drain. I'm like, no, when it's raining, rain is supposed to go in the drain and out, not coming out of the drain. So that's why flooding is also happening. So again, why is this happening? It's because of how we are consuming, it's how we are leading our lives, and we've got to make that change. And uh, see for yourself, you know, it's, you'll see bit by bit if you pay attention to what's out there in the environment and you'll see like, you know, am I part of this problem? Am I consuming using a plastic cup that I drink in 30 seconds and then I throw it away? And it's not also about littering because a lot of people on my Instagram say, oh, it's littering or people should stop littering and throwing things on the street. No, you throw it in a bin, it could end up in the drain. You know, plastic gets blown by the wind, um, and everything goes into landfills. We don't have proper recycling plants. I mean, that's the honest truth. And I keep trying to tell everybody, we've got to break that myth and assumption that if I put it in a recycling bin, it's going to magically disappear. It does not. You know, so whatever we consume, like today, we're all bringing our reusables. We've all got our tumblers. They're just drinking straight from her coffee tumbler. We all. If we bring reusables, then there's reducing waste. So all of that is, is really important to, to really take care of, all, of our environment. Thank you. Thanks. Um, you mentioned the haze and you mentioned climate change. I mean, sometimes I think there's a risk of uh, these issues getting conflated, which is linked to the awareness point. So everyone knows about the haze. You know, essentially that's Indonesian farmers illegally burning peats. You know, it's blowing over here. You get haze in Delhi, uh, Jakarta, Beijing, for different reasons, whether it's too many coal-fired power stations or cars on the road, etc. And that's you know that's air pollution. That's I think right in front of people today. But climate change, you know, is much more about the longer-term trends, and it's about the global temperature rise, you know, which informs the kind of sea rise. So um, you know, when I think about Malaysian awareness, um, I think that people are aware of those problems that are in front of them. You know, you see all the time in the media, you hear politicians talking about plastic waste. Um, and the air pollution, the water pollution, some of the issues you were describing. But I don't see an awareness about climate change. And when I say that, I mean the science of climate change, perhaps in the way that there is a general level of awareness now in some other countries. But I, I don't think Malaysia should be criticized for that necessarily. If you go back to the Paris Agreement, which was the last big agreement where all the countries got together, they agreed to keep global temperatures to below two degrees of pre-industrial levels. And they hoped to keep it to 1.5 degrees. Now, at the moment, we're at 1.1. And just to throw some stats at you, the 0.2 of that 1.1 uh, has happened in the last five years. And so, you know, it's getting, uh, it's increasing, and, and it's getting faster. Do I think there's an awareness about that? No, I, I don't. Um, but then, you know, I don't think the government probably feels under pressure, and maybe it shouldn't. If you go back to the agreement, Malaysia's a developing country, the obligation historically has been on developed countries, of course, because they did the emitting. And, you know, the priority is to grow the economy. And, you know, it's underpinned by fossil fuel. So, you know, that's, that's a fact. Um, so I, I think, you know, there does need to be more awareness um, about the science. I think Malaysia's making a great start. The fact there's a, a ministry which has climate change in the title. You know, a lot of countries don't have that. It provides a peg for action. Um, there's a lot of great stuff going on with renewables. Uh, there's, I know that the minister, Yobi Yin, I think is very dynamic. She's refused a number of coal-fired power station licenses. Uh, there's a big push on energy efficiency. Uh, ultimately, Malaysia is something like 0.67% of global emissions. And I know that you know, the government's looking at China and the US and India and the EU and saying, well, you, know, you need to take action before I do because I'm just a really small part of this problem. But I think now um, you know, we're on the cusp of a tipping point where it's about, I was looking at the list of emitters, it's about 40 or 50 countries who are 0.67. 
And if they all took that attitude, you know, we'd be in big trouble. Because together they make a massive slice of the pie. So we do need to see change, we do need to see more public awareness, I think, to help contribute to solve the problem. So what we do is not just give away free trees. Our program very rapidly grew to an environmental capacity building um, program. So we run an, uh, we, we call it our environmental stewardship program. And a lot of it is sharing knowledge, sharing resources, and the skills to basically save the planet. So we run through programs on water scarcity, climate change, um, workshops on gardening, obviously. Um, also, we cover um, composting and waste. And we've trained about 15,000 Malaysians since we started. But what we do when we run about 11 programs per week, and in each of these programs, we'll ask generally it's adults, adult groups as CSR or children, and we'll ask them, why is water precious? Tell me, what is the global temperature rise? It's blank looks. They don't know. And you hear the words climate crisis, but you don't know how to connect all the dots. What does a 1.1 degree temperature rise actually mean? And why are people panicking and why are they scared? And it's this lack of beyond, oh, I should be um, reducing my waste. I should be thinking about reducing my energy consumption. But what does it actually mean? And it's this knowledge that people, they haven't got that fire lit under them to, to make them, um, cause them to, to create that action. Um, and it's great to see Alice Smith doing it. Now, my children and, and Emma, they did a climate strike and they handed out information to try and and see if they could rally the kids and get them interested in the climate crisis. And still that knowledge wasn't there. Um, we tend to find in a group setting, if we do ask the questions about water scarcity and climate change, the, ch the people that actually answer are between 10 to 12 years old. So they're actually being taught it at school, part of the curriculum, especially in British schools. But everybody else is absolutely blank. And it's scary because it's the adults that are leading, the adults that very critically need to make the changes to save us from this existential crisis. Um, and so having the adults try and educate yourselves more into why we need to be making these changes very rapidly is what we need to be doing. Thank you. And we briefly touched upon the economy just now when we talked. So for Naja and Rushman, our experts over here, um, how do you say all these changes are having an impact on our community with respect to consumer choices, and preferences, as well as maybe the way we conduct business? I do um, Can I just start by saying, when I was growing up, uh, we didn't have the internet. And I grew up with the internet. I, I don't want to make sounds or anything about the murder and being plugged into your telephone line, but anyone, I might sound a bit old. Um, but what I was going to say is that um, we live in a world where information is at our fingertips, right? So both businesses and consumers, you know what? There's no excuse anymore. There's no excuse anymore. Um, one of the things that I work on at the moment is ethical and sustainable fashion. I'm very passionate about it. Obviously, I'm a sustainable consultant, so I'm across different industries. But um, our consumers, young people, everyone really, I've got young, younger brothers and sisters, they are aware. They know what organic is. <laughs> Um, and so we live in a world where they are asking questions. And so they, you know, you might live in an industrial state and then you might like smell something funny in the morning and you might be like, oh, what is that factory doing? You know what, there is no, nothing stopping you from like knocking at the door of the factory and asking you, what do you guys do? Because we live in a world where um, we are connected. So in terms of consumer behavior and businesses running themselves, if you are not aligned with the world that we are coming into in terms of being part of the solution, like Rashvin said, then you're gonna be left behind. So consumers are very aware, and we have new generations coming out now, you're gonna be asking more questions, you're gonna be going into your engineering degrees, and you're gonna try and solve solutions, uh, solve problems. Um, and uh, in terms of fashion, we have, this, we have this movement called Fashion Revolution, and it asks um, people who made my clothes. So just even having that conversation, just being transparent about what you do. For me, sustainability is not perfection, it's a journey. So when you start something, you start somewhere, make a product or something like that, whatever it is, your business model, just be honest about what you do and then tell people the story behind your product or your service and be transparent. People, consumers now want businesses to be transparent. They're taking so much away from us. No offense, businesses. Um, 
And so businesses have to keep up, I think, pretty much uh, ASAP. And so that's, I, I think, the, the 21st technology world that we're living in now, like, just enables us to become more aware, but also more empowered to ask questions. So ask questions, people. I know there are parents in this room, and you probably get questions every week about, like, um, but yeah. And you guys, and, and as parents too, I, I, I meet parents and they're like, oh, my children are asking me this question. I have to be prepped for the right answers. So we are more definitely aware, Malaysians everywhere around the world. Can I try without the mic? <coughs> okay, so whilst, whilst I agree that, true, I'm super important about consumer action, right? Public action, civic action is super important. But I mean, think about it, right? So we've got seven billion people and Consumption is inevitable, right? You, you're not going to stop that. It's going to go to 9 billion people, and you've got a whole demographic of people who are aspiring to have European and American levels of life. That means a lot more consumption. So in terms of this, I think the big shift needs to happen in how do we, we get to reimagine consumption, right? So reuse, reduce is super important, but countries like India, Africa, it's growing population. So people are going to now, the question is, how do we consume? And whilst it's great, we need to be led by ourselves with our own tumblers, our own leadership by example. But I'm gonna take a slightly different stance and I think that it's critical and we actually need businesses to lead the way, right? I mean, recycling and all, it's retrospective. We can do as much as we want, but if Coca-Cola and Pepsi puts a million bottles every day out there, guys, what we do is tiny, right? And why I bring this point is because I feel a lot of us here wear dual hats or we have dual value systems. It means on weekends, we're all activists and we're also passionate and super caring and all that. But when we go to our work to Monday to Friday, we make standard business decisions, right? We do procurement decisions that don't necessarily reflect environmental causes. A lot of us in this room are probably in very high power positions. <clears throat> but ask yourself how many times have you not signed off on a business case that is for an environmental friendly project that reduces waste drastically. Not for the cute eco label, but for something that would drastically change plastic bottles, change the way we consume. And we should ask questions, that helps. But guys, like, this system is <coughs> entrenched in ca capitalism and growth economics. And we need, so I like what Jerry Brackmeyer Fuller said, that if you want, so he's the guy who designed, it's an amazing design in the 50s, and he said that, if you want to change a model, change a system, you need to reimagine a completely different model, right? And we can make our city engagement worse, but I think a lot of us here need to look at the Monday to Friday battles and not just the weekend battles. Sorry. A <laughs> 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 sense, sense of like. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> kids, it's not on you, right? I'm not, you guys are doing great. <laughs> Circular economies are not business as usual. Yes. Can, can I add yes. to that? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's this is the reason why. I mean, I believe change comes from within organizations. So I'm probably in the same camp as Rashvin. <laughs> uh, we went to the climate strike on the Friday that Rashvin organized at Publica with BGBG. He wanted to get organizations to actually yeah. come out on a yeah. Friday to just kind of like at the lunchtime and just kind of like <coughs> did quite work. But anyway, we went to the climate strike. They showed up. Like organizations hardly showed up. Yeah. They didn't want to give the employees time off work because. Two hours on a Friday is too valuable for bottom line, you know, like. <laughs> um, And yes, and then we went to a conference start on Saturday. But I, and that's why I feel like when I want to work to change systems, I want to work within <coughs> the systems. Um, and so you make small business decisions every day based on sustainability principles. I mean, that's <coughs> what I've been doing, basically. The stuff that people don't see, actually. You make small changes every day. So whenever you make a decision about procurement or changing a toner, or like firing someone and suddenly yeah, in installing a, a, a new built IT system, what, it, what is the impact that you're actually um, having uh, other than just saving money? Are you having an environmental impact or a social impact? Are your employees happy, that kind of stuff? So uh, I, I do, I do want to just add on to that point and I feel like we can all do that every day, small decisions every day. 
Can I also add to that? Um, I do a lot of uh, behind the scenes lobbying with businesses as well to make changes and give them ideas and options. And you know, I'll put it up on my social media like I wish I could see less plastic in supermarkets. Why do all our fruits and veg have to be wrapped in plastic? And now there is, and I've seen examples uh, overseas in France, they're mm -hmm. doing less. And now we also have it in Malaysia. And she just told me, cold storage, just said, look, we're inviting you to the launch. We've got a corner where the vegetables are not in plastic. And I actually said in our last visit when uh, Prince Edward was here in Malaysia, I said, I would love to see like in the UK, those farmers markets, beautiful fruits and veg, not wrapped in plastic. He said, oh, that's a hard call. And then I was like, but it's happening. <laughs> it's actually happening. So, and even with businesses such as the Boba Tea Plastics, you know, that's a huge plastic <laughs> pollution. I, I don't drink boba tea, okay, so. But I'm like, if you guys want to drink your boba tea, please bring your reusable. And uh, there were some outlets that did not allow people to bring reusables. So I listed the ones that did, because I'm all not about being negative, but about being positive. So I listed the ones that do allow you to bring the reusable. And then I, behind the scenes, I wrote to those companies and said, please allow your customers to bring reusables. They listened and they made that change. And I said, why don't you do like Starbucks? Have your own Tumblr and branding because I understand you need branding. You want to show this is your brand and they are now selling it. So it's all about being behind the scenes and you know pushing. Even recently I was with Nestle CEO and uh, he has, they have changed. Nes uh, I think Nestle uh, Malaysia have now put Milo paper straws instead of plastic straws. That's a huge change. I did it with my husband, Cold Stone Creamery Malaysia. I said, look, I have to say no to plastic. You can't have all these plastic spoons. <laughs> it just doesn't look good on me. <laughs> and eventually he managed to find the right biodegradable wooden spoons and paper straws for his milkshakes. So he's the first franchiser of Cold Stone Creamery to do that here in Malaysia. It's not been even done in the US. And he's the first in the ice cream here in Malaysia to do wooden spoons. So it is about... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so at the end of the day, it's uh, you know if we can all go out there and influence other people, it's totally possible to make that change and just be hopeful and uh, you know keep on plugging. Is what I say. Yeah, a lot of it has to be driven from society, so you have to have that top down, but you have to have that bottom up to, to make those changes and, and drive change. Yeah, thanks. That was thought provoking for sure, to say the least. Um, so let's move on to the second question. So on 20... Might be actually. So, uh, on 20th to 27th September 2019, uh, we saw a record million, 7.6 million people take to the streets and strike for climate action, which is the biggest climate mobilization in history. That's pretty cool. So um, Malaysia kicked off its participation in the global climate strike last month with community organizing rallies and strikes and talks. Um, so this time, specifically for Tekun Natasha and Dave, um, all of you guys seem to do it, of course, but um, most of the biggest actions we see are community-driven, right? How are we to encourage policymakers to further support these movements or introduce permanent initiatives that will benefit the environment? Uh, I think you need to educate policymakers in the same way we're talking about educating the public. They're no different, right? They may have become a politician, but before that they had a life and um, they've not necessarily been exposed, you know, not been exposed to the science. Um, I think it's quite compelling now. Years ago, there were a lot of people calling climate change a hoax. Now, you know, important statistic, 97% of the world's scientists all agree that it's extremely likely it's human activity which is causing the global temperature rise. So that's a pretty good cert you're going to bet on that, I think. Uh, and I think to bre breaking that down so that, you know, be, there's a lot of science out there, I was talking about the internet and you know what's available it's very user friendly uh, in a way perhaps it wasn't again many years ago um, I think also it's about the economics so a lot of people understandably you know worried about economic growth worried about jobs it is now possible to decarbonize you know your your economic growth um, a lot of countries have done that in recent years and it's an ongoing you know massive obviously piece of work uh, and there's, there's a lot of countries in Europe that are starting down that track but 
when you've got a lot of fossil fuel industries, um, you know, it's a huge concern you know, in terms of local jobs, and I get that. Um, you've got to provide, the government's got to provide tax incentives. So you were talking about the solar panels on this school, uh, letting people kind of feed into the grid, for example, and get cash back for their own individual um, effort. And you've got to try to achieve uh, cross-party consensus on this stuff too. So there's nothing you know, worse than when um, you can't move forward because it's just politics get in the way. I think in the UK, we've been very fortunate because it's a there's complete, across all political parties, you know, they're signed up to go carbon neutral by 2050, um, really aggressive policies. You don't see that in the States, for example, where they're sort of gridlocked uh, between the Democrats and the Republicans. And so, you know, it's not just about the government in power, it's about educating the opposition as well, uh, and, and all of that, the support structures, the civil servants, so that everyone, you know, gets it. Um, and I was interested to hear what you were saying, um, you know, about agriculture and, and so on, and, and the use of land. Uh, there, there's some much more radical policies you could adopt out there, but I think you've got to engage the community. Um, I mean, if you are going to start closing coal mines or, or you know, changing the way your economy is hardwired, that is going to affect livelihoods, and you need to be able to reskill people. And there's a conversation around that. That's not a, you know overnight thing, clearly. Um, but if you are, for example, to reduce meat consumption. Uh, that uses a lot less land than it does if you're growing other proteins like nuts and vegetables and so on. Um, but that's quite controversial. It will be in some countries where you know land is uh, scarce. Uh, so, yeah, I think basically it's about um, educating those policymakers, you know, in the same way that the public is now seemingly you know more aware. Just want to say. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Can you hear me? <laughs> so. Um, I think, you know, I keep telling all the youth, I do a lot of talks at universities and schools, and I say, you guys have the power to create that influence, you know. Um, it's great to have this climate strike, but, you know, I'm glad that in Malaysia it happened over the weekend. It happened on a Saturday, because I do believe students should be at school, <laughs> especially in Malaysia. And so if you're doing it in your, in your off time, that's great, you know, to, to really rally to that cause. And um, what I say is like, you know, the, the more that you write or the more that you voice your opinion and uh, demand for the change, then I think policymakers have to pay attention. The great thing about um, the ministry, about Mestec and YB Yobian, last year we launched the Malaysia Roadmap towards Zero Single Use Plastic 2018 to 2030. And she invited every single um, state uh, exco for environment. And she, ple she asked them to pledge and say, pledge to Malaysia's roadmap because, you know, federal can't just do a nationwide ban, so you have to get the states involved. So most of the states were there to sign and pledge that they were on, on board with zero single-use plastic. And this is the kind of thing that we need to do more in Malaysia, is to get your, you know, I always say to students, write to your local MP, write to your state exco and say, this, you know, I want this to happen, I want, and and I also said one thing to the Slamo State Exco of our environment. I said, we should also stop thinking about charging people. Tax incentives is so key. You know, to turn eco, it's so expensive. That is the actual fact. It's 250 to 400% more on your profit margin for a business to go eco from plastic to biodegradable or compostable option. And uh, so, but they, we don't want to charge the customer on that. So, you know, what about government also giving incentives to businesses that go eco? And not just about energy, uh, green energy, but also, you know, if we're going non-plastic and we're giving other options, they, they should be able to be recompensed. And the same for the plastic bags. Why charge 20 cents? Why not get cash rebate? You know, that would be more impact, uh, impactful and effective for, for a customer to say, hey, I'm getting 20 cents back or 50 cents back rather than I gotta pay because you know it's 20 cents. 20 cents is not a lot. If you go to Denmark, I think it's uh, two euro 50 for one plastic bag. That will make you change your mind. You yeah. will not get <laughs> one plastic bag. <laughs> right? So these kind of things, we need to really think about you know, with policymakers, what ideas, and when other countries are doing it, it's possible, like zero food wastage, France was doing it where supermarkets can't throw away surplus food. So I decided in 2016, why are we throwing 230,000 tons of food during the month of Ramadan from the buffets when I go out there with Kachara Soup Kitchen and there's a lot of homeless and people in need who can't even feed themselves, uh, babies can't even have milk, their kids don't even have breakfast or lunch. 
So I saved those surplus food. I wrote to a lot of the supermarkets. We got Tesco on board, we got Ion on board. I got the 23 hotels on board. And every year I've been saving the surplus food. And this year we saved 10 tons of surplus food in one month to feed those in need, to feed the homeless and the urban poor families. So these kind of things, you know, when you see something and it triggers like, wait, there is something wrong with this picture. I need to do something. So I didn't just sit there and rant on my Facebook. I actually wrote, okay, you know what? I'm gonna write to all the hotels that I know. Please give us your surplus food. And we did it every night. And even this year we saved about, um, I don't know how many, we, I think we saved about a ton from the first Bazaar Ramadan, which is in Kampong Baru. We imagine 400 stalls, and they have a lot of food, and when it rains, they can't give their, you know, they, they have to throw away that food. So we, every night, we picked up food, surplus food, to go and feed the homeless. And uh, 10 tons, it's a lot. So if you think about it, that would have gone to the landfills. So these kind of actions, you know, that once you keep on sharing the actions that you do in your own community or in your school, if you completely go green and eco and say, I am the first school to be plastic free or stop single use plastic, policymakers have to pay attention. <laughs> they can't just say, hey, you know, this is not my problem. It is their problem, it's everybody's problem. And it's not just the environment's problem, it's also Ministry of Education. You know, I said to YB Yobian, you need to work with Ministry of Education, put this in the curriculum in the national schools so that we understand we need to start young. And most of my eco-warriors, they're as young as 10 and 11 years old. It is amazing. They're my junior eco-warriors, they're the ones telling their parents, Mama, I want to go and do the Princess Beach cleanup. The mom is like, what? It's a Saturday morning, we have to drive two hours to Pantai Mora to do a beach cleanup. And then this boy who's like 10 years old, right? He tells his dad and he posts. And it's amazing. I look at his, read his posts and it's so informative about plastic and the pollution and what he's picked up. I'm like, he's 10. Come on adults, we need to, you know. And it's the parents are like, why is he so into going to zero waste stores and Origins Bolt store and all this? And it's them that are driving the agenda. And so policymakers, you have to understand, you I mean, at the end of the day, it's the future generation as well, it's gonna vote for you. So you've got to, you know, pay attention to what they're asking. So I say, stay in school, do your work, <laughs> be creative, <laughs> write to your local MPs. <laughs> yeah, you've gotta, you know, there's no point just to be out there in the street and, and you've gotta be able to be smart and creative as well to get the policymakers' attention. Thank you. Also in a role, exactly like you said in Tengganu, uh, we do Radang, we've done Kedah and Langkawi. So we try to get a lot of the kids, and I do a lot of talks with the university, with the school kids. And um, so they see, you know, a lot of times people think, oh, the trash that we're picking up in Radang is from the local residents. It's not. I find, you know, food wrappers from Vietnam and plastic bottles from Thailand, it's all coming from the tide, right? So we're trying to show everybody we're all involved. If I go to a marine park, and instead of snorkeling in this Thailand marine park, national park, I was like, I see plastic. So we were picking up all the plastic instead of snorkeling, and I picked up five kg of plastic trash. It's just pretty amazing. So to reach out to the rural is to show them as well. I mean. Burning is one of the issues, I think, uh, for climate change on the East Coast. There's a lot of open burning. Um, it's still quite, it's quite, you know, you can smell the haze when uh, on the East Coast. So that's, I think, something that also needs to have the, the governments and the local councils to really bring the awareness and the education. So again, it's working with Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Environment. And sometimes when I spoke to YB Yobi and she said, this is not under my purview, it's actually under the natural water, land, mm. air. So that's another ministry. And I'm like, we all just need to work together. That's, yeah. that's the only way to make, to, you know, move forward. And especially when you say about the rural outreach so that they can understand 
hey, you know what, burning my trash is not a good idea. <laughs> So I'll be honest, I think we're quite guilty of being very urban um, and that's something we definitely got to work on. Um, but also that being said, in terms of like focusing critical efforts, we're currently in Malaysia and globally probably have similar stats. We're about a 65% urban population and by 2050, we're going to be an 80% urban population. And that's, that's a global trend. So I think it's quite critical that we look at the whole how cities need to be redeveloped and solving the urban problem. But this is my take on the rural part, right, which I think is lacking. So in the rural part, we have a super, especially in Malaysia, right, in Malaysia. So you mentioned we're, we're 0.46%, easy for us to brush off our responsibilities and look at the developed countries. But what Malaysia forgets is that we're one of the top 12 most, bi like, most biodiverse countries in the world. Right? We have a huge role to play in terms of protecting wildlife, protecting biodiversity. And this is so intertwined with the rural lifestyle. So when it comes to like whether we still consume turtles, how do we look at um, wild boars in the jungle, how we look at orangutans. So this is such a fragile ecosystem. So I would look at the rural um, <coughs> interventions slightly differently. Waste is super important, but I would look at it at like how we could assimilate them better into their natural livelihood bringing better ecotourism programs that because they also need development. Um, but yeah, I look at it from a slightly different angle because they've got a bigger role to play. Yeah. I can add something to the I, um, can I correct that? Can I just give you a little bit of a different perspective, Loretta? Uh, I know that maybe like the media or something like that, or whoever covers news stories um, about urban programs and yeah, I'm starting people doing all that kind of stuff. But, do you know what? I, I have a couple. My company is in Kuala Lumpur, uh, just outside of KL, uh, in, in Selangor, obviously. It's Selangor River is there, and I grew up um, having like a warum, which is like a place where you can eat on the jetty. And we bring tourists to see Klik Klik, which is fireflies on the Selangor River. It's an eco tourism place. And, uh, you know, I remember that was 20 years ago now, but like I would go over there every, every um, school holiday and help out my grandma at the time, my late grandma. And you know that the click click, the fireflies live on burbung trees, and the burbung trees actually sort of uh, uh, are situated in the mangroves, sort of like around the wet areas. And you know, throughout the years since development, and we have noticed uh, fireflies, you know, we just don't see a lot of them anymore. Um, so, what my, my take on it is that actually, the thing is, people in rural areas actually are, a bit, are actually aware, are more eco conscious than probably KL lights are. Or, urban people are and I say this because they see it in a different way though. Mm. But they don't they don't label it as being sustainable or eco conscious. They just know, they're just aware. Um, you know, they still play in the rivers. They probably I mean when we talk about sort of outside of uh, urban areas we talk about people who are maybe a little bit less fortunate than us or uh, on a lower socioeconomic uh, scale and they they notice things a bit differently, that's all. Um, we just don't label, they just don't put labels on it. So in terms of reaching out to uh, people outside of the urban areas, I think it's about language. I, I work, I'm an engineer, for God's sakes. <laughs> We're stereotyped as people are boring and straight. So I've always, I've, I've, I've actually worked hard over the years to actually drop that barrier in, in communication to other people. I think I talk like a normal person. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And you know to get so, so to get that barrier down, and I think I, I realized when I was younger, like being a greenie wasn't cool. Not cool for some reason, but uh, I realized wasn't cool. Me. I know. And so what I was trying to say is that um, when, for example, with Claw, uh, the company that I'm consulting with at the moment, I'm working with now, we have 220 bins around the Klang Valley area at the moment to recycle. Did you see that bin downstairs? It's pretty. You guys. I mean, we, but because we focused on consumerism and a lot of our urban youth or adults are buying fast fashion and that's where we started our efforts. Um, we're rolling out our bids to sort of outside of urban areas now I and mean, we're having 20 bins uh, rolling out in Negris Milan, woohoo! Uh, and you know, um, I think we have one bin in Alugaja, Himalaya now. Nice. Yeah, so 
I mean, as, as we get our programs right and we focused on some of our priority actions and action areas, then we can, we can sort of, you know, focus on different things. But that's just not just for fabric recycling, it's for anything else really. But I really, really do think that the way we engage um, our community uh, is so important because they're so diverse. You know, we're talking English here now in this room. And uh, we can all understand each other, and I hear an Australian accent somewhere there. Um, but, you know, when we go out to communities and different people who are of, of a different background, education, whatever it is, um, I, I really do believe that it needs to be personalized in terms of the things we want them to be aware of and linking that. So I think someone mentioned before about linking, you know, the data, I think it was you doing the data and actually action on the ground. I mean, they know they can't throw rubbish everywhere willy-nilly, but they're like, but why? And so, and they don't want to see rubbish in the Selangor River where the fireflies are, so they know it's not nice, but they don't understand why we have to do something. So, um, I, would, I would take a different point of view. I, I would say that they're the OGs of being eco-conscious, uh, but maybe they just don't brand themselves that way. And also, in terms of Resource consumption, as you said before, Rajvin, I mean, their footprint's probably lower. We don't live in eight houses with air con in every room. You know, so, um, you know, we can learn a little bit of each other. Just just a point. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> 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 What I was going to talk about was um, having movements and campaigns and things are all well and good to raise um, knowledge within a society, but if you don't have that policy change from the government, there's no drive to, to sustain it long term. So you don't want it to be a program that's run by one person, one NGO, one government party. You want it to be able to be shared from party to party if they change, and, and long term. And so the policy changes is, is necessary. And what's really exciting is that the uh, MESTEC and um, Tun Mahadhar and um, Natural Resource Ministry are coming up with new policy changes specifically for climate early next year. And uh, they've been talking a lot about renewable energy lately, so they're saying all the right things for renewable energy, which gives me a lot of hope. Um, what they haven't talked a lot about and what we need to be making more noise in, about is protection of our carbon sinks and planting more trees. So I haven't heard a lot about that, especially for our biodiversity. I still hear a lot about um, forest cover and the definition of forest cover in relation to primary and virgin jungle is actually very different. Too. Um, so speaking up about virgin jungle, primary ecosystems and um, protection of our carbon sinks at this point before they make that policy change early next year is vital. Um, so when they do come up with those policy changes, it will drive change for hopefully it will be, I mean, some of the rules and regulations that we have currently are so archaic. They're from 1984 before climate change. So to update it and um, make those new changes will be fantastic. But having that knowledge at the ground level, to be able to implement those changes is what's key. So the top down and also the ground up at the bottom, because if you have these regulations in place and people don't understand them, they're not going to um, be able to embrace it um, and make those changes in, in the speed that we need to. So that rate of adaption, you want to make sure that it comes in and people readily adapt it, because climate change is the biggest threat to the global economy. They have to make the changes, and they have to understand why they need to make the changes. And I think that's what's that's what's missing, and we'll get that early next year. I'm going to just add to that. Um, we're working with the Malaysian government on the development of a greenhouse gas inventory, uh, which is you know really critical part of the infrastructure. Um, and if people are familiar with things called the Green Development Technology Centre, it's going to get rebranded as a climate change centre to be a kind of hub for government of knowledge and learning, but also where this inventory would be based. And they're talking also about the legislation that would then mandate businesses uh, and state governments to actually provide data around the amount of emissions and where they're coming from, because you get absolutely need that data to then take the right courses forward. Just to add, sorry, I forgot to mention, when I grew up with nothing new, I always had hand-me-downs. You won't believe it now, but I turned out okay. Um, <laughs> so there's nothing wrong with like wearing second-hand clothes, okay? I just want to make that clear. And keep clothes in circulation. So that was my plug for today. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, just to conclude the discussion we've been having, um, we just wanted to know your thoughts on what comes next in Asia. And what, are there, what do you think the nation's future will look like when it starts to tackle climate and change? I'd say for anyone in mind, it's, the awareness is there, people are 
seen the images of you know plastic straws and turtles and you know whales, beached whales with like 400 kg of trash and plastic in, in their stomachs and things like that. But now I think the next step for Malaysia and Malaysians is making that switch because though they see it, they're still posting the plastic cup or the plastic straw and they think and and then now there is this trend thinking well if there is a biodegradable option then that's fine i can still like biodegradable plastic bag I mean. and the myth is that actually to break that assumption biodegradable plastic bags do not disappear because you need a special recycling plant facility mm -hmm. at a certain temperature heat for that to be able to break down so it's still floating out there whether you have your so my point is I think we need to make that switch to realize like hey um, I need to reduce reuse refuse that's my key thing I don't talk about recycling I talk about refusing and we need to I need to be able to change my friends I mean my friends are, are still you know posting their plastics so I'm like if I'm not able to change my friends yet how am I going to change the mass public out there so we need to be able to put together that image and that fact that we are creating this mess but how is our consumption and our usage and our daily life, how can we make that change step by step? That's the whole thing is you've got to do it step by step. But I'm hoping that you know more, more voices out there, more youths out there can influence their parents to say, hey, you know, I actually um, influenced uh, the palace, the Slava Palace. I said no plastic water bottles because we had that in our events. Mm -hmm. And I said no plastic straws, so we have stopped that. There is no more plastic water bottles, there's no more plastic straws. In fact, they looked at me and said, How do we drink it without the plastic straw? I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> like that, like how we used to. So they were like, Okay, so, so no, now no more plastic water bottles, no more straws. And it's about making that influence and change. And it doesn't need to be me, it can be everybody, it can be 10 year old, it can be the, the team, it can be you guys, you know, just doing it community by community. That's it. <laughs> I'll just say from a government perspective, uh, what I'd like to see, and I think we're starting to, is that climate change is seen by every ministry as a priority, not just the climate change ministry. I know this is something that frustrates you over the year, but whether it's transport or agriculture, land or water, it's got to be mainstreamed, and that's when you really start to see action and everyone coming together. There isn't yet sort of national, for example, committee where all the ministries get together and talk about climate change, isn't there? you know, sort of national strategy in that sense but they're talking about it, and a lot of the legislation that's coming down the tracks will help inform that. Uh, sorry, I, I, I would say that, to, to go in, I've got about three different things in my mind, it's all good. Um, I was gonna say, like, I think empowered nations empower policy makers. So I think we don't, so we still are seeing that gap as we were talking uh, earlier with the panel. Um, the thing is, like, the will of the government is like, it's like so, so hard in terms of push, push, like push, you're, we're pushing it. But empowered nations, and there's something, there's a term called social capital. You know, when you when you actually have people who are educated and aware, and actually push and push and push, suddenly, like, not not saying that the government shouldn't be well ahead already, but you know, when there's that enough push, then the timing kind of makes uh, public policy happen. But I work in the waste industry. Surprise, surprise. Um, there, ninety percent of Malaysia's waste is landfilled. 90%, let's not even, and the composition of it, I mean, there's like plastics, food, fabrics, you know, textiles, all that, a lot, everything, okay, most of it, construction, waste, all that kind of stuff. So, but 90% of Malaysia's greenhouse gas emissions is actually from the energy and oil sector, and then actually the rest of it is from the waste sector. So the waste sector is actually a big player in reducing Malaysia's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, obviously, I come from a fabric perspective, but yes, I do agree with you. Recycling is the last resort. We have, we, we at CLOS, we talk about um, the five R's, which is um, rethink, so think before you use, reduce your use if you did use it, and then reuse it if you can, like if, for example, your clothes, keep it in circulation for longer, if you can't fit it anymore, or you feel like it's not the right color this season, give it to your mate. You know, I do a swap clothes party. And then, and then after, you know, your raggedy t-shirts, you know, finished its life, um, you might have a little hippie logo on it, something you feel like it's not, you know, cool anymore. You can repurpose it into bath mats. I'm just saying, you know, keep things in circulation. We talked about circular economy before, and then we need to keep looking at that sort of model now, not just for clothes, for waste, for things that we consume, reduce first. 
And then at the end, after you've finished all your, uh, you can't do anything with things anymore, then come and find our bins. We are in 20, 220, 20 locations. <laughs> So, so that's that's where I'm going um, from from a take make sort of waste sort of model. Just think about how we can keep things in circulation longer. I mean, for me, that's what you can do. Apart from writing to ministers and all that kind of stuff, but for me, that's probably the easiest thing you can do. Thanks. Yeah. So I would say that if you asked me this two years ago, I had a very different answer. Um, but I'm actually very optimistic about Malaysia as a whole because I think we're at the height of our civic engagement. So people like you feel very empowered. So I'm very excited about that. Um, but I'll, I'll say one thing though. Like, so while we talk about Malaysia, I think it's quite nice to leave the room with this message, right? These issues we talk about are cross-border issues, right? They're super global issues. And for example, my buddy over there, Carlos, he's actually Australian, but he's working with Sea Monkey Project, and they've, they're, they're helping islands over here work with the precious plastic to solve waste problem over there. So I would love to see you guys bringing back your international connections and you know, whether it's knowledge, whether it's networks, whether it's resource, whether it's you know, academic collabs, <coughs> it would be great to have that a lot more. Because I think the minute we stop looking at it as a border, border issue, and like, oh, this is Malaysia's doing bad, or Indonesia's cause the haze, and Singapore's like too small, so it's not worried about them, and like, you know, like, <laughs> no offense, man. Singapore's great. Like, right? I, I think the minute we move this conversation, like, it's good to go deep, but it's also good that we move higher, and we look at it as like a super connected issue, and yeah, if I solve yours, you solve mine. So like, yeah. it would be nice to have more of that. So that's for you. Yeah. <laughs> Which you are doing, so that's all. Yeah. Oh, what about the panel? What about you guys? What do you think? <laughs> I mean, you have to go. You've been asking all the questions. Yeah, tell it. Okay, the last Yeah. Oh, yeah, that is, that is a good question. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to see? What do you want to see? I mean, like, I'd say the future is pretty bright as well. In that regard. So, um, we've started the ball rolling, that's what I'd say. Um, things are getting started. Like, I, like you said, actually, I wouldn't say this five years ago because things were very different back then. So, I'm, I actually come from India. I'm from a pretty small town in India, a um, coastal town, in fact. And, yeah, um, people there aren't particularly aware. It's not a particularly international town. Um, <laughs> that's why you want to call it, but yeah. Um, so I've seen I've seen what non-awareness looks like okay. in that sense. So I know what it's like to see people who the very nice people mind you, like people who want to make the best for their community, but then they're not aware. They're not aware of what's going on in the world. They're not aware that there's this climate change going on, right? So I've seen plastic being tossed into the seas. I've seen very very polluted beaches before. And yeah, things like that before. So uh, that's why five years ago I wouldn't be able to say the same thing. But now that I'm here, and now that also I'd say the whole world is progressing something to some extent at least, um, there is there is hope. We see well now. Let me refer to India again because that's where I'm from. It used to be all plastic bags back then, but now it's biodegradable. And even though that may not be a huge change, that's still a start. And if you go to McDonald's, um, what they used to have these kind of like really nice McFlurry cups which are like plastic. I like those, but then now they have like a paper ones. Those are nice as well, but they're like a good step. So um, yeah, I think things are going well and then I hope that within the next 10, 20 years or so, we'll work things out. Because like you say, this is the critical time. Yeah, yeah I, I agree completely. I think that I have a lot of hope for the future. I think seeing, especially for the past two years, it's coming so much more prominent in social media. It is really inspiring to see young people who are my age, like Greta Thunberg, reaching out and doing things which are changing the world. We start to see in our own school community people like taking on, uh, we, did, we did like a climate um, little strike within the school before we've gone out and done different things. And it's really inspiring to have my friends um, do things which make me go, yeah, I'm going to do that too. I'm going to cut out plastic. And listening to talks like this, having days like this, it does, it does provide hope that people want to change. Um, so yeah, I hope that it will change and we can see it in the government as well. Okay. Can I ask you please to uh, thank Vish and uh, Loretta for their uh, work this morning as to, to lead the panel. I mean, that's
I did not expect you to put on the spot like that. <laughs> but they were amazing. Yeah, well done. Well done. Uh, no, I, I've been very optimistic about the future, and I think um, to see what was happening around the world recently with, with students who were taking days at school to, and I know they should be in school, but, <laughs> but, uh, but, to, um, but to, 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 to say this is an issue for us, uh, this is the world that we're inheriting, and uh, we need to, to make a difference. So, can I just ask you please to give a big round of applause for our panelists? <laughs> So reduce, reuse, refuse. Uh, we will try and recycle as well, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but there's a message, I, I think. Certainly reducing is the key, I think. Uh, consumer society, we just need to, we don't need less is more, and we just don't need to continue to consume the way we do. Um, so thank you very much to our panelists, and uh, I'd like to ask you to stay around. We're open, running till 12 o'clock, go downstairs, have a look at the displays that are there. Uh, please, if you haven't had a chance to support what we're doing through the various projects, uh, the Green Thumb projects are running, please, if you can, offer your support, uh, be part of what we're trying to do. Um, but thank you very much for coming along this morning. Uh, I think we have um, a couple of staff who will help to show you the way down the stairs so, so you don't get lost. I think we've got Dr. Maria, we've got Jamie Thistleton here. Um, so if you follow them, they'll take you out to the back door and you can go back down the stairs. Uh, enjoy the rest of the morning. Thank you very much for being part of the day. And big thanks again to our panel. Thank you. Thank you.